Alex Berry here for Wargamer.com. Today we're looking at 1775, The American Revolution. It's put out by Academy Games, and uh, as you can tell based on the title, it's about the uh, American Revolution. And it, it uses the, the Birth of America system that was developed in, uh, for the 1812 Invasion of Canada uh, game, uh, with a few modifications. It uh, it has sort of the uh, cube draw uh, activation system to to find out which title or which faction rather is going to move, and uh, based on card draw will determine uh, the type of movement that can be done, and then dice rolls uh, inflict combat. Now, one one of the issues with 1812. Uh, was that the game wasn't balanced because the the British side would have three cubes to the American side two uh, and it just that extra movement was too powerful for the British and they'd be winning about 80% of the games played. Here uh, it's equal sides uh, and it's balanced and while there's other combat units in the game such as you know, the, the Hessians to aid the British or the French to aid the Americans, you still have, uh, you don't actually have a separate movement cube for that. And I think this solves that issue. It's really, really a wonderful game. Um, the artwork is excellent. Uh, here you have the rule book. Uh, rule book generally lines out things quite well. Um, Good color rule book with uh, the rules in black, then explanations in red, and things are well done. There's also some uh, different scenarios. You have the main campaign game. You also have sort of the Siege of Quebec scenario. And there's, there's really some neat, interesting things there. You also have sort of a historical overview of the American Revolution, um, some good history you know, background for someone who might not be familiar with it, um, which is, it's a really nice uh, rule book. The art's excellent, as you can see from the, the box cover, the art's fantastic. On the map as well, it's really a beautiful map. Um, and then the card art is quite good too. Here you have, you know, the British warships, um, the the British regular, and then, you know, an event card for Joseph Brandt. Um, wonderful art. The card layout's fantastic. You have how the game, the card affects the game, adding two Native American units. Um, and also some wonderful flavor text, sort of about Joseph Brandt. Here it says he was a mili Mohawk military and political leader who led Natives and Loyalists against the American revolutionaries. Some people may not have been aware of who Joseph Brandt was, so I really like the fact that they've included the flavor text here. We can also see that there's a number here, and this is important because depending on the scenario you play, you build your deck with different uh, cards, and it's you know a card activation system. So you play a card here, this would let you move two armies, three spaces, for instance. Uh, one other thing I think uh, worth talking about here is this insert. Now they've tried to develop a really fun insert for uh, the game that really preserves, uh, you know, stacking. So you don't have a lot of games. You know, you check out the insert and you want to just, you know, stack as best as you can. Here they really tried the developer to make things interesting. You've you, to put the dice here. The, cubes here and then you could lay your cards on top and it, it it's really a noble experiment but it doesn't work unless you simply lie uh, your game down on a shelf and then just take it to the table if you're throwing this in a car or you're transporting it all it's going to rumble too much the cards are going to go flying the cubes are going to go flying the dice are going to go flying and it, it'll be a big mess when you open it up so I, a noble experiment that failed but for the actual gameplay, it's fantastic. It's really, really beautiful. The decisions are always interesting. 
Uh, it's always fun rolling the dice. And while this isn't, you know, a total simulation, you know, there's no loyalists where, you know, 96 ought to be. Um, generally, it's, it's a solid, solid game. So why don't we uh, take a look at, uh, at how it plays. Let's do a sample turn. So here's the board on initial setup. First, we're going to see uh, basically who adds some more troops. So here we've joined the, the Loyalist cube. So we're going to add uh, four additional yellow Loyalist cubes, four additional red Regulars cubes, and then the American side will add four of each uh, for their two factions. So I'll just do that now uh, off camera. So we've done that now. And uh, we sort of start the game in earnest. We're going to draw from the bag, see who goes first. And here the British regulars are going to go first. We'll put that down here on the turn. This is the first round. The first three rounds have to be played before the game will end. Uh, the game ends when one side, that is, plays both of their truce cards. Um, and then at the end of that round, the game will end. Whoever is controlling the most colonies will win the game. To control the colony, you have to have all the units in a colony. So for instance here, uh, the British are controlling Delaware. It's only one uh, region and they're controlling it. Whereas say Maryland here is not controlled by anyone even though there's more units and more regions uh, that are American there is still this one British Loyalist marker in this region, therefore the American player doesn't have control of Maryland. So first thing that happens on the British player's turn is we're going to enter the uh, reinforcement phase. So the British player will take four cubes, well, four, and now they can only place them in cities in colonies that they control. So for instance, if they wanted to reinforce Boston, they can't do it. They can't muster anyone there because they don't control Massachusetts. So at the beginning of the game, the only places they can do are uh, Dover in Delaware, Montreal, or Quebec City in the province of Quebec, and uh, Halifax down here in Maine. I mean in Nova Scotia. So the British player is choosing to add a cube to Halifax. We'll add uh, three cubes here in Delaware. And now he'll play a card. He's going to play this uh, card. This will be two armies three spaces. So he doesn't have to actually move that full amount, but uh, that's what he's going to do. So he's going to move. He will move and he has to have at least one British regular there. So for instance, he couldn't move this loyalist army uh, because there's there's no units there. But here uh, the natives are kind of neutral and they're going to join with uh, whoever uh, enters them first uh, and you know convinces them to join. So that's a really neat mechanic I think with the natives. So with the British going first, it's big advantage to try and gain control of the natives so they're going to move. And so here they'll move one army, one, two and a second army, one, two, not using the full movement, but now they've convinced these natives to join up with them. So they've got a pretty powerful native contingent in uh, upstate New York. That would be their turn. They'll then draw another card. It'll go into their hand secretly. You're gonna have always a hand size of three cards to choose from. If at any time you have three events, you need to discard and reshuffle. You, as you notice also here, there's this kind of uh, fleur de lis in the upper right hand corner that it denotes that it's used in the, the Quebec uh, scenario. So it's kind of a quick way to tell if a card is used in the Quebec scenario. For instance, Joseph Brandt, not used in the Quebec scenario. We now uh, move on. We 
see who's going to go next, whose turn is next. And we have here the Patriot Militia. They'll get all their fled units back, but there's been no battle. And then four cubes. So they're going to put, their only options really are here in Connecticut and Rhode Island. They're going to put all four in Newport, Rhode Island and try and drive out uh, the British in Boston. They will play this card, two armies, two movements, and they will move in. Now they're going to leave behind uh, a couple of units because unlike in 1812 here, your command decision can cause you to move into any uh, region as long as that there's not an uh, enemy occupying it. So, whereas that ability only existed for the natives in 1812. So you really, in order to, because controlling colonies is so key, you need to leave behind units. So we have those guys moving in, and we're also going to move in this. So it's two armies, one from Massachusetts, one from Rhode Island, to attack uh, the British here. Now, uh, we're going to roll dice. The British will roll first in defense. So they have, even though they have four regulars, they're only rolling uh, two dice uh, for the regulars, and then they can roll three dice for the militia. All rolled. We have three hits, two command decisions. However, you can't command decision out by sea and flee, so they have to stay in. Now, hits will be applied by the opposing side, so the uh, Americans choose to lose three militia units because they'll take hits. Uh, they don't hit quite as well as the, the British regulars. And that is uh, shown here on the player aid. So you can quickly tell who hits at what ability. Here, Patriot Militia doesn't hit as well as the Continental Army and they flee uh, easier. So that was the, the British. Now the Americans get to roll. They have two hits. Uh, the British are going to apply them both on the two regulars because that will allow them to use the maximum number of dice. Now, after this, the British will roll again. There's no uh, ability to retreat here. The battle continues until only one side occupies. The way you retreat is using your command decisions uh, to get out. So, again, here the British cannot use command decisions. The Americans could to retreat if they wanted to. We're going to roll the dice. Here we have one flea. So, this guy sort of just flees into the hills, disperses. He's going to go here into the fled units, can come back on a loyalist turn. And they have one hit, which the Americans will apply to their Continental Army. And now they get to roll their dice. They have three hits and a flea. The British choose to apply two to the loyalists one to the regulars. Now they also have a command decision here. So the American player is going to choose to move one back here to Newport, Rhode Island. That will enable him to move those units uh, on his turn. Otherwise, with only regulars there, he couldn't move it. Though, most likely he'll put reinforcements there. It's just to help shore it up as a defense in case uh, of enemy attack. So now it goes back to the uh, British player, his one regular, it's a hit. Uh, the uh, American player choose to put it on his regulars. And now they'll get to roll their dice. Now they don't get to roll three anymore because they're reduced down to just two. And we'll roll. And no hits and a flea. Not what the American player wanted. Back to the British player. It's another hit. Uh, I'll choose to play it on the Continental Army. Now the American player will roll. And he gets successful hits. And therefore takes control of Massachusetts. 
it's now another colony. It's now three colonies to three colonies. If the game ended now, it would be a tie. But you cannot end the game until the end of the third round. That is basically how a game, how a battle works. Um, it's always interesting on where you're going to attack. Combined arms, having you know the Hessians combined with loyalists and Indians, you know the biggest army possible. It's going to allow you to roll more dice, even if you have a ton of you know cubes. Let's say you've got ten uh, Continental Army cubes, you're only rolling two dice each battle, um, which I think is a really interesting aspect uh, to this game. Now that the Americans control Massachusetts, they can put units in the city there. They can put units into Boston. You can't put units here or here when you're mustering uh, on a reinforcement phase because there's no city. I really like this aspect of you can only build in colonies you control and in a city in that colony. Really, uh, you know, just adds the importance to controlling the colony uh, and, you know, the limiting uh, tension of having uh, you building only in a city. It's really a wonderful game. Um, that's how it, how a it turn works. I'm not going to do the the next in the turn because you, you've kind of got an example of, of how the game plays out. Really, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, one of my issues, I think, with the game is, you know, at the time, Maine wasn't a separate, uh, you know, colony uh, from Massachusetts. It was, you know, part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And uh, it just seems odd. I mean, I understand why they've done it for gameplay purposes because of how they're using uh, the colony system. But, uh, you know, even to just call it Maine and have it different, it just sometimes strikes uh, the wrong chord. It, uh, other than that, you know, maybe they should have had this part of Massachusetts. I don't know if after doing a lot of playtesting, it unbalanced it because then it's too tough to, to control Massachusetts. Maybe they didn't want to have a special rule, um, so they just named it Maine and had a different color. But that's one of the few things that irks me. But other than that, uh, really a wonderful game. Uh, such interesting decisions to make. Um, and while it, you know, it doesn't get to the depth of some of these Hex Encounter war games, it's a, it's a fantastic light war game. Um, you, you should really look into it, unless, unless you're only into a game that has, you know, these really long war games, or you don't like games where there's dice, and you don't like games where there's luck, um, but, you know, you sh probably shouldn't be watching this review if you don't like uh, games where there's dice being rolled. Otherwise, uh, highly recommend this game. Uh, go out and get it right away. It's fantastic. Uh, I have not played a bad game put out by uh, this publisher, Academy Games. And I don't think there's another publisher I can say that about. Uh, they're really, really top-notch. Till next time.